Today we're going to continue our investigation into rotational motion by talking about something called angular momentum. Remember, so far up until this point we found out that with rotational motion there's rotational equivalence of pretty much everything we've talked about in terms of linear motion. We talked about the rotational equivalent of a force is torque and position, velocity, and linear acceleration also have rotational equivalents we called angular displacement or angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. Well today we're going to find out what the rotational equivalent is of linear momentum or translational momentum. So remember we defined something's translational momentum or P as the product of an, an object's mass and its velocity. It had units of kilograms times meters per second because we're multiplying a mass times a velocity. And the equation we had to to figure out how much something's momentum will change or try to figure out whether something's momentum will change is that the change in momentum of a system or of an object is equal to the net forces it experiences multiplied by time. And remember this force has to be a force outside of the system. Well what's the rotational equivalent for momentum? We're going to call that angular momentum um, and we're going to use a capital L to represent the quantity of angular momentum. So think back to translational momentum. So P is equal to mass, which is something like it's how much it resists linear acceleration. We call that like a translational inertia times velocity. Angular momentum, the expression for that is actually really similar. Uh, it's equal to something's rotational inertia times its angular velocity. So it's kind of like the rotational equivalent of mass times the rotational equivalent of velocity. So we get angular momentum is equal to rotational inertia times angular velocity. The units for angular momentum will be the units of rotational inertia, which is kilogram times meters squared, multiplied by the units for angular velocity, which are radians per second. The expression that we use to figure out if something changes its angular momentum is actually going to look really similar to our expression over here for how we calculate how much something changes its linear or translational momentum. So change in P equals F times delta T. The rotational equivalent of that is this. The change in L or the change in something's angular momentum will be equal to the torque it experiences multiplied by time. And just like our equation over here our torque has to be an outside a torque applied outside the system and it's this represents like the net or the sum of all the torques on the system so something will change its momentum whether it's an object a spinning object or a spinning system of objects can change its angular momentum if it experiences an outside net torque for some amount of time Luckily, all four of these equations are on our AP Physics 1 equation sheet. These are not something you have to memorize. So I want to take you guys through a little thought experiment and then kind of show you the results. So imagine I'm sitting on my classroom stool. It's very low friction, so we're going to assume friction is negligible, so there's no frictional torques. Let's say I'm hanging on to a few extra weights, and I get myself spinning, so I give myself an initial angular velocity. Once I give myself that initial angular velocity, and if frictional torques are not significant, what's going to happen to the angular momentum of me and the weights combined? Well, remember, angular momentum is the rotational inertia times angular velocity. And if frictional torque is not significant, we would expect my angular velocity to stay constant, which means my angular momentum should stay constant as well. Remember our equation we just introduced? Um, if there are no net torques, if we're assuming friction is not significant, and there's no other forces or torques that I'm feeling, then uh, I or whoever's spinning shouldn't change their angular momentum. So the change in the angular momentum of the system will be zero. And if the system doesn't change its momentum, that means the angular momentum at some time Initial time will be the same as the angular momentum at some final time. So if there's 
no change in angular momentum. That means the angular momentum of the system, which is I times omega, or rotational inertia times angular velocity, that has to stay constant. So if at some time we multiply the rotational inertia times the angular velocity, let's say at the beginning of spinning, you know, that's going to be some constant value. And if the angular momentum doesn't change, if we check some time later, the product of rotational inertia times angular velocity should be the same because it's constant. There are no outside torques. And if you think about it, the rotational inertia of, let's say, me hanging onto those weights, if I kind of keep them stationary, uh, the rotational inertia of me and the weight system is the same. So if I doesn't change, that means omega doesn't change. But here's a question. Is the rotational inertia of a system constant, or can the rotational inertia of a system be changed? If you remember, we said that where a mass is distributed in a rotating system affects how much it resists angular acceleration. And so the rotational inertia of a system can change if the mass is either closer or farther away from the point of rotation. So that means if uh, I or the rotational inertia of a system can change, if you, if you have a spinning object, let's say somebody's spinning, spinning on a stool, if while they're spinning you can change the rotational inertia, if I changes, then the angular speed or the angular velocity has to change so that the product of those two things stays constant. So here's a second question. How could the person spinning on the stool with the weights change the rotational inertia? Well, you, that person could either move the weights farther away from their body or closer to their body because they are spinning about a point which is about the center of the stool. So we're going to look at a little video which shows what happens when I get myself spinning. I'm going to give myself some initial angular velocity. I'm going to start with the masses out here. And then I'm going to bring the masses in closer to my body, move them back out again. So I'm going to change the location of those masses, changing the rotational inertia of, of the system, and find out how that affects the angular velocity. So here I am taking the weights, and I'm going to give myself some initial angular velocity in the positive direction. And watch what happens as I bring the masses in closer to my body or farther away. Let's look at that again. When the masses were far out, that means I have a large rotational inertia with that angular velocity. And as I bring the masses in closer to the center of rotation, I'm reducing my rotational inertia, which means my angular velocity has to increase so that the product of the rotational inertia times angular velocity stays the same. Masses get farther out, rotational inertia goes up, angular velocity has to go down. Mass is closer in, Rotational inertia is decreased, and angular velocity has to increase. So from the video, we can see that changing the rotational inertia of the system by either having the masses farther out or the masses closer in had a very clear effect on the angular velocity of the system. Remember that the system as a whole, if we're considering friction to be negligible and frictional torque to be negligible, the system it's angular momentum, which is rotational inertia times angular velocity, that has to stay the same, that has to be constant. We'd say that angular momentum has to be conserved. And if angular momentum is conserved, that means the angular momentum at some initial time has to be equal to the angular momentum at some final time. When the rotational inertia of the system went down because I brought the masses closer in to the point of rotation, my angular velocity had to go up so that angular momentum was conserved. So it turns out that the conservation of angular momentum shows up in lots of different places. Two examples are trying to do a backflip or figure skating.
Turns out, if you've ever watched somebody do a backflip or you've tried one on your own, whether it's on a trampoline or the ground, um, to be able to rotate through the air faster to get your body to spin, what do you do as you're in the air? You tuck your body as tight as you possibly can so the point about which you're rotating or the mass, your mass is closest to the point about which you're rotating. If your like, body is full flat out, you're not going to be able to rotate as fast because you've got a larger rotational inertia. When you think about figure skaters, think about uh, them, let's say, spinning around a single point of rotation so they're rotating about this center right here. You've all seen videos where a figure skater is spinning around and then all of a sudden they start spinning faster. Well, what did they do? They got more of their body closer to the center of rotation that increased their angular velocity. When they want to slow down rotationally, they kind of like put a leg out or put their hands out or put a leg and hand out, which increases the rotational inertia and then decreases their angular velocity. So we're going to look at two sample questions to think through the application of this. This actually is a sample College Board question. So the question is, it says a diagram shows a top view of a child of mass m on a circular platform of mass 2m that is rotating counterclockwise. So a kid on a merry-go-round. Assume the platform rotates without friction. Which of the following describes an action by the child that will increase the angular speed of the platform child system and gives the correct reason why? So it turns out the answer is B. The child moves towards the center of the platform, decreasing the rotational inertia of the system. So what's the justification for that? Well, if the platform is spinning with no friction or frictional torque, then the angular momentum stays the same. We'd say that the angular momentum is conserved. So L equals I times omega. That has to stay constant, the angular momentum. The only way to get the angular speed or angular velocity to increase is by decreasing the rotational inertia. So if the child can decrease the rotational inertia of the system, the angular speed will have to increase so the angular momentum stays constant. The child can reduce their rotational inertia and that of the system as a whole by moving their mass closer to the center of the rotating platform. So let's look at a second sample AP style question about angular momentum conservation. Let's take the same child slash platform system, basically a kid spinning around on a merry-go-round. So when the student is at the location shown in the diagram, the child platform system has an angular velocity of 1.2 radians per second. At this instant, the student platform system has a rotational inertia of 200 kilogram meter squared. The student then moves away from the center of the platform and the rotational inertia of the student platform system is changed to 400 kilogram meter squared. The rotational inertia went up. The question is, what is the new angular speed of the student platform system? Well, the rotational inertia increased because the kid got farther away from the point of rotation, so that means the angular velocity has to decrease. And so already we know that uh, it can't stay the same. It can't still be 1.2 radians per second, and it can't have gone up to 2.4 radians per second. It has to either be options A or B. So let's look at quantitatively. So if we're assuming friction is negligible, that means there's no outside torques, which means there's no change in angular momentum. The angular momentum of the system has to be the same. That means the angular momentum of the system that's spinning at some initial time or before something happened has to be the same as the total angular momentum of the system after that thing happened. Well, angular momentum, remember, is rotational inertia times angular velocity. So rotational inertia number one times angular velocity number one equals rotational inertia times angular velocity number two. So let's plug in the values we know and solve for what we don't. The initial rotational inertia of the system is 200 kilogram meter squared times the initial angular velocity of 1.2 radians per second. That's equal to the final rotational inertia of the system, 400 kilogram meter squared, times the final angular velocity, 
If we solve that for omega 2, or the final angular velocity, we get that it's 0.6 radians per second. It's half of the initial angular velocity, which makes sense, because if the rotational inertia of the system goes up by a factor of 2, that means the angular velocity has to change by a factor of 2. It has to be a factor of 2 times smaller, or 0.6 radians per second.